In 1401 BC, in the first year of his reign, Pharaoh Tutmosis IV conducted the first accepted excavation of what we call the Great Sphinx of Giza. The excavation only exposed the pores and front of the giant monolith where he placed the Dream Stella, a rectangular slab of granite 3.6 metres high and weighing some 15 tonnes. The Dream Stella tells the story of how Tutmosis, a then prince of Egypt, slept atop the statue and through a dream made a deal with the monolith. The Sphinx promised he would be pharaoh of all Egypt as long as he freed him from the sand when he took the crown. We don't know if Tutmosis was the next in line to be pharaoh, however he had some opposition he needed to dispose of. Some have theorised that the Dream Stella is just a way of Tutmosis IV legitimising his ascendancy. Whatever the truth of the matter, one thing is certain. In 1401 BC, the Great Sphinx of Giza was already an ancient monument enveloped by the sands of time. Just how old this wonder truly is, has baffled everyone who has studied it. Welcome to our curious past, where we dive into the oddities of the ancients, ruins and structures which don't fit within the current narrative of history, searching the unexplainable and inconceivable feats achieved long ago, often ascribed to those who give no claim to their creation. The Great Sphinx is a topic of heated debate, one which rages on in academic circles right up to the present day. Credible evidence has been put forward for the Sphinx belonging to a past now lost. This astounding carving was cut straight out of the bedrock and in recent years and in times now past it has been restored with limestone blocks, something which hides the actual deterioration it has suffered. Egyptologists attribute the original carving of arguably the world's most recognisable ancient monument which measures 240 feet long and 66 feet high to Khafre, who reigned between 2558 BC to 2532 BC in the 4th dynasty of the Old Kingdom. Although, as with all things concerning the Sphinx, things begin to unravel immediately. To start with, there is no agreement on Khafre's reign. Most put the totality of his kingship at 24 to 26 years, nowhere near long enough to have the Great Sphinx carved let alone reign long enough to have his giant supposed tomb, the Second Pyramid of Giza, built. Even if you take Menopho's suggested reign of 66 years, a historian of Ptolemaic Egypt, this is simply unachievable. The Turing King List, a papyrus fought to date to Ramses II, which is extremely fragmented, mentions Khafre by name, but the part noting when he ruled and length of his reign is missing. Khafre is also mentioned in the will of Prince Nakare, his brother, which was carved into the prince's master batum, but the will is assumed to belong to Khufu, rather than Prince Nakare, simply because he was their father. A complete assumption based on no evidence, something which seems to permeate modern Egyptology. Some have offered the face of the Sphinx for evidence of Khafre having carved the statue, but this is widely disputed even within academia. With the face being attributed to several pharaohs, it is highly unlikely this hypothesis will ever be confirmed. The inventory stella, discovered in 1858, very close to the Sphinx, which has been dated to around 670 BC, notes 22 divine statues owned by the Temple of Isis, which includes the Great Sphinx. It goes on to suggest the Temple and the Sphinx were present before the time of Khufu, and that he rebuilt the temple anew, in other words, restored it when he rediscovered it, along with the Great Sphinx. However, Egyptologists suggest the stella to be a fake due to the inaccurate use of names, accusing the priests of creating it to give the temple a much greater history than it is supposed to have. Perhaps another assumption used to ensure the current narrative of the Sphinx and other monuments in Egypt fit within a particular time frame. Maybe the reasoning for this is a simple one. The way names were used or mentioned in documents changed throughout Egypt's long history. The truth is, no one actually knows who is responsible for carving the Great Sphinx, only one of the many mysteries surrounding this imposing monument. 
The ancient Egyptians are known for their exceptional record keeping, but during the Old Kingdom, the time of Khafre, there is no mention of the Sphinx that we know of, nor did Khafre or any other pharaoh during any other time claim to have carved it. We have no idea what its original name was, or what the people of the Old Kingdom called it. Another example of something spectacular being attributed to someone who gives no claim to it. Even in the New Kingdom, no reference of who carved the Sphinx is given to us. They refer to it as Hor Am Achet, meaning Horus of the Horizon. The name Tutmosis IV gives the Sphinx in the Dream Stella, the first mention we have of the statue in history. The name Sphinx itself was only given to the monument in classical antiquity around 2000 years after Khafre, an ancient Greek word depicting a mythological creature who had the head of either a woman, a falcon or a ram, had the body of a lion and wings. Something the Great Sphinx is missing. It should be noted that it is common for sphinxes in Egypt to have a man's head and no wings. Perhaps the ancient Egyptians found the Great Sphinx in the sands and were so enamoured with the Colossus they adopted it into their burgeoning culture. The ancient Egyptians and ourselves are not the only civilization fascinated with this great oddity in the sands. During the Greco-Roman period, the Giza Plateau became a tourist attraction with the monuments regarded as antiquities. Some Roman emperors visited the Sphinx out of sheer curiosity and some for political reasons, but they found the place and its monuments just as fascinating as we do. Emperor Nero had the Sphinx excavated in the 1st century AD and a monumental stairway was built leading down to the Sphinx's paws. However, this no longer exists, having been removed in the 1930s during a series of excavations. A stella dating to 166 AD commemorates the restoration of the walls surrounding the Sphinx, one of the many restorations it has undergone during its lengthy life. The last emperor connected to the monument was Septimus Severus around 200 AD, but soon after the fall of the Roman Empire, the Sphinx was once again abandoned and engulfed by the desert. Along with the many excavations and restorations, there were also periods of vandalism and attempts of destruction. During early Arab rule in Egypt, farmers were found making offerings to the Great Sphinx in an attempt to garner favour during the harvest. The Muslims saw this as iconoclasm and Arab historians recorded the defacement of the Sphinx, particularly the nose, first attributed to Napoleon's cannons, being purposefully broken off, the remains of which are now lost. Pictures from the 1800s showed the Great Sphinx in a terrible condition, and there were likely more attacks on it over time. The Great Statue at one point had a beard, remnants of which were found around the enclosure. It either fell off or was purposefully removed, but more intriguingly, it is thought to have been a later fixture due to there being no damage to the chin, where the beard was most likely attached. This gives justification to the theory of the head looking very different when the statue was originally carved. The head of the Sphinx is noticeably smaller than the body, given the indication the original head was much bigger. The two main theories for what the original head looked like are a lion, suggesting the statue was a lioness acting as a protector for the pharaoh's supposed tomb, or it was Anubis, the Egyptian god of the underworld, depicted in ancient Egyptian art as having a dog's head and a man's body. It is very possible, and most likely based on the evidence, that the head of the Sphinx was altered at some point during the past, maybe by Khufu when the inventory stella suggests restoration work was carried out, or maybe by his son Khafre. We'll never know what the original head was, or what it looked like, or who was responsible for its carving, but it suggests the Great Sphinx is much older than is currently being pushed upon us by the current narrative of history. Throughout its own history, the Great Sphinx has been associated with many mysteries due to its enigmatic nature. Various entrances and holes have been found including a hole at the top of the head, an entrance to an underground system at the rump of the statue, and where researchers have been able to undertake scans, other anomalies have been noted, such as voids beneath the pores, in the body of the Sphinx, and directly underneath. Egyptologists say this is not the case citing over-exuberance and false data as the cause. However, work at the Sphinx's pores has been conducted, said to have been excavated in the secrecy of night, 
then covered over with a wooden walkway which is present today. There is a square section which can be lifted out to allow access to the excavation, but what was down there, if anything, hasn't been disclosed. The infamous Hall of Records has been mentioned over the years. Edgar Seiss, a clairvoyant, told of a civilization which was destroyed long ago, settling along a river in the Sahara and depositing knowledge of this lost world in the Hall of Records, located under the Sphinx's paws. Tales of Atlanteans resettling the Nile Delta after their homeland's destruction has always been prevalent, a story which comes to us from Plato, a relative of Solon, who found the original story of Atlantis in an Egyptian temple in Sais. A curious history for another time. Another strange feature, pointed out by many who have looked into the statue, is under the right ear of the head. There appears to be a stone plug, giving rise to many theories, including the possibility of something which could fundamentally change our understanding of the ancient past being hidden behind it. Whatever the truth may be, all of records and knowledge behind an ear or nothing at all will never have the answers until those who have the power to do so excavate in, under and around the Sphinx and give full disclosure rather than hiding behind secrecy and stubbornness to the old paradigm of history. What's more, it might also help us understand the true age of this mysterious monument. If you subscribe to Cafre being responsible for the Great Sphinx's carving, it would still be incredibly old, around 4,500 years from the present. But many Egyptologists and independent research believe it is older still, given various argument for it being the oldest monument in all of Egypt, with some geologists believing it could be present when the Sahara Desert, whose sands have buried the Sphinx numerous times, was green. Other than there being no records or claimants for the carving, the main theory for a much older Sphinx is erosion patterns on the enclosure. Robert Scotch, a prominent geologist, along with others, noted horizontal lines scarring the enclosure, which he believes are the work of wind and sand attacking the limestone over a vast period of time. What surprised him most were the deep vertical lines which he stated is evidence for prolonged rainfall. The last time the Sahara saw the amount of prolonged rainfall needed to create such erosion was as far back as 9000 BC, around the end of the last ice age. This has been largely criticised and dismissed by Egyptology, their only response, this cannot be the case. They simply refuse to believe the evidence presented to them. Hopefully one day they will allow further study of the Sphinx enclosure to help us better understand its history and in turn our own. Perhaps this fits the story of a lost civilization resettling on a river in the Sahara, or to certain monuments including the Great Sphinx belonging to an older, pre-Diluvian civilization which was lost, only to be rediscovered, venerated and used as a sacred place before being added to their own less impressive works of construction. The current dating of the Sphinx at around 2500 BC is only 600 years after the supposed beginning of ancient Egyptian civilization. How a relatively new civilization mobilizes the populace to undertake such tasks to move such vast amounts of stone is unknown. The fact that the ancient Egyptians didn't mention these structures in their records until at least around 1000 years after its supposed carving makes it even more anomalous. One more thing to point out here, which is the strange facts surrounding ancient Egypt and other ancient civilizations around the world, is the older the structures are, the more impressive and grandiose they seem to be. The Great Sphinx is no exception. Whether we'll truly know the origin of the largest, most well-known ancient statue remains to be seen. If Egyptologists continue to ignore the data presented by other disciplines and researchers, statues, monuments and other structures in Egypt may never receive the admiration they deserve. More importantly, we may never know the truth of our past. The Great Sphinx could be a relic of a past lost. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to find out more about our curious past, please consider subscribing to the channel.